we have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. The affirmative task we have now is, uh, is to actually um, create uh, uh, a new world order. And one of the ways it will drive the change is through global governance. We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, a world order that I think all of us would like to see. Never before has a new world order had to be assembled from so many different perceptions. It's about the future of Europe and a new world order. It is a new world order. But the burdens of global citizenship continue to bind us together. A change of leadership in Washington will not lift this burden. In this new century, Americans and Europeans alike will be required to do more, not less. Partnership and cooperation among nations is not a choice. It is the only way, the one way, to protect our common security and advance our common humanity. That is why the greatest danger of all is to allow new walls to divide us from one another. The walls between old allies on either side of the Atlantic cannot stand. The walls between the countries with the most and those with the least cannot stand. The walls between races and tribes, natives and immigrants, Christians and Muslims and Jews cannot stand. These now are the walls we must tear down. I have decided we really need camps for adults. We really need camps for adults. A new world order. today but believe that we are approaching Armageddon. Whoa, that word means something. And that the four horsemen, you know, there are four horsemen that Jesus gave in the book of Revelation, four of them, that would point toward Armageddon. Wait a minute. You got your seven-year period of tribulation there. We've been gone before that started. Right. The Bible teaches that for those who know the Lord, who are saved, there's going to be what is called the rapture. That's when you go up in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, as 187 trillion billion miles and 11 one hundredths of a second. As 187 trillion billion miles and 11 one hundredths of a second. 
That's what General Electric says the twinkling of an eye is. 11 one hundredths of a second. What a trip it's going to be. And we won't be paying $200,000. It's free because for by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. So we're going up soon. It's described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 18. Now, after that comes a seven-year period of tribulation. We know it's seven years because it's called one Shabuah, one heptad in Greek. And that is Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. So the tribulation hour recorded in Revelation chapter 6 to 18 is a period of seven years. During that period of time, we, the bride of Christ, for that's what believers are, are married to the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, recorded in Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give honor unto him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife, the bride of Christ, the church, hath made herself ready. Then we come back to earth for the honeymoon with our Lord. The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints that had and what is written by Paul is experienced by John. It's a voice like a trumpet says, come up here, which illustrates what will happen to God's people when the church age is done. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. What's he going to shout? I can't be sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't say, come up here. Wouldn't that be great? In whatever language you're used to hearing it in, come up here, boom, instantly. So then in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, the church is in heaven. The church is safely ensconced. The church is safely ensconced in heaven, tucked away for a seven-year honeymoon. A seven-year tribulation is going on on the earth. After that seven years, Jesus will return to the earth to stop a judgment, a war that is going on, and we will come with him. Very similar to a Jewish wedding. At a Jewish wedding in ancient times, there would be a wedding ceremony followed by a feast that usually lasted seven days. While people were feasting, hanging out, fellowshipping, the bride and groom would be tucked away, away from the crowd, away from the world, at the end of which he would, the groom would present his bride after that wedding. So that takes place in heaven. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, back on earth, chapter 6 through 19 is the worst possible tribulation period the earth has ever seen, ever, ever, ever in its history, according to Jesus, worse than any other time in history. God pours out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting sinful world. Poor horsemen, that points to the coming of the Lord. I like the first one, especially the white horse. This horseman is riding on a white horse. I like that, don't you? And Jesus could come at any time. You're going to get shocked here and excited in a minute. People need to be warned that Christians throughout history have always gone through tribulation. And there's a time of persecution and tribulation coming that's unlike anything that the world has ever seen. And we need to warn people so they can be prepared spiritually. The reason that we made this film is not to split doctrinal hairs. These events are real events that are really going to happen. And we need to warn people that there is a time of persecution, tribulation, and distress that's coming upon this world, unlike anything that any generation has ever seen. And most Christians are not ready for it at all. They've been lied to, they've been told this fairy tale that at any moment we're gonna disappear, we're all gonna be gone. But I'm here to tell you that people are gonna be in for the shock of their lives if we don't get this information out there. Jesus warned his disciples of the tribulations that they would go through so that they wouldn't become disillusioned. And most Christians are gonna be caught by surprise when these things start to happen because they've been told that the rapture is gonna save them before any of these bad things happen. And we have put out this video to warn people about it so that people can be prepared for it especially prepared spiritually for the things that are coming. These are real events that are gonna take place and these are serious events. There have been serious persecutions and tribulations throughout history. There's been a lot of famine throughout history. There's been a lot of warfare throughout history. There's been a lot of, of natural disasters throughout history. But what is coming 
is unlike anything that the world has ever seen. And people aren't ready for it. You try to warn people about it, and they've been so brainwashed by their pastor that the pre-tribulation rapture is going to save them. They are not spiritually prepared for the kind of persecution and the kind of suffering that's going to come upon this world. So the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2.1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So the Bible flat out tells us that the day of Christ is not at hand. And he said, if anybody tries to tell you that the day of Christ is at hand, he said, that person's lying to you, that person is a deceiver. He said, don't be deceived by a word or by a spirit or even by a letter as from us, a letter claiming to be from us, saying that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. That day shall not come except X, Y, and Z happen first. And yet they'll say that day happens at any moment. It's at hand, his coming is at hand. He can come at any moment. He said right here, let no man deceive you by any means. That day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshiped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. I think Satan's plan with the pre-tribulation rapture is to get everybody to have this mentality that Jesus Christ is coming at any moment. We're expecting the second coming of Christ at any moment. He could come today, he's coming today, but really the person who's coming is the Antichrist. And so everybody's expecting Jesus Christ to come back. Well, when the Antichrist comes, he's gonna say, I'm Jesus Christ. I'm the second coming of Christ. The Bible does not teach that Jesus Christ could come back at any moment. But the person that probably could come at any moment is the Antichrist. The Bible's clear, he's gonna come first. And so Christians are expecting Jesus Christ to come at any moment, and guess who's really coming? The Antichrist. And guess who he's gonna to claim to be? Jesus Christ. I just wanna make it clear that every religion in this world, every false religion, is waiting for their Messiah and they're all being set up for the coming of the Antichrist. And the pre-tribulation rapture is the event to set up Christianity as well. The Muslims are waiting for Imam Mahdi. The Buddhists are waiting for the fifth Buddha. The Hindus are waiting for Krishna. And now evangelical Christianity is being set up through the pre-tribulation rapture for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at any moment. And these are all names for one person, the Antichrist about tonight the subject of the rapture and the tribulation and the fact that very clearly in the Bible the rapture comes after the tribulation but when you talk to people who believe that the rapture comes before the tribulation they can never show you a clear scripture that the rapture comes before the tribulation they can never show you just point blank here it is now I can easily show right here point blank where the Bible says it's after the tribulation but they have no scripture that they can point to that just very clearly points it out. So they have to really explain a lot of things to you and use a lot of logic, but they don't have a scripture that will spell it out. I think that the biggest misunderstanding on this subject comes from people not understanding what the word tribulation means. And they confuse the tribulation with God's wrath. And because they confuse the tribulation with God's wrath, they say, well, God's not going to pour out his wrath on his own people. But I'm going to show you very clearly tonight that the tribulation has nothing to do with God's wrath. And if you can just understand biblically what the word tribulation means, I think the rest of it will come clear to you. It'll make sense to you. Now, one thing to prove that God's wrath and the tribulation are two completely different things is that in Matthew 24, 29, it says immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon shall not give her light. So the Bible's real clear in Matthew 24 that the sun and moon are darkened after the tribulation. Well, then if you go to Revelation 6, where you read about when the sun and moon are darkened, when the sixth seal is opened, it says, for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? So according to the Bible, God's wrath does not come until the sun and moon are darkened. When the sun and moon are darkened, 
is when they say the great day of his wrath is come. Present tense is come. So if Matthew 24 says that the sun and moon are darkened after the tribulation, and if God's wrath doesn't start until after the sun and moon are darkened, how can they be the same thing? Let's break down that term, pre-trib rapture. Okay, it's got three elements to it, right? Pre means what? Before. Before. Trib, what's trib stand for? Tribulation. Tribulation. And then you've got rapture. Okay? Well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. The concept of the rapture is in the Bible because we see Jesus come in the clouds, people are caught up together with them in the air, and so forth. So the concept of the rapture is there. The word rapture is not used. Is the word tribulation in the Bible? Yeah. The New Testament uses the term tribulation 22 times. So if the New Testament uses the term tribulation 22 times and everybody's going around with this doctrine called the pre-trib rapture, shouldn't one of those 22 verses or 22 passages or chapters teach us something about a rapture happening before the tribulation? Yeah. I mean, if we can go to 22 scriptures that bring up the, the tribulation, if there's a rapture before the tribulation, if we're going to call a doctrine, if we're going to name it after the tribulation, call it the pre-trib rapture, wouldn't one of those passages teach us that the rapture comes before the tribulation? I'm looking for it. I can't find it. Because I hear these people talk about, oh, the Bible clearly says that we're going to be taken out of here before the tribulation. And there's going to be rapture before the tribulation. Let's go to the first time in the New Testament, Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Of course, Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. And Matthew 24 is the first time that Jesus teaches his disciples about this subject of the tribulation, the, 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 the second coming, and so forth. Look at Matthew 13. This is the first mention. And I've noticed something about the Bible. God wants us to understand the Bible. He's not trying to play tricks on us and confuse us and make things difficult. He wants us to know the truth. He loves us. Okay. And so I've noticed that a lot of times the first time the, the Bible brings something up, he defines it for us. And he helps us understand it. That way when we see it the second time, We'll know what he was talking about. So let's look at the first time. This is significant as being the first time the word tribulation is used. The Bible reads in Matthew 13, 21. This is the parable of the sower, by the way. The Bible reads in Matthew 13, 21. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by He's offended. What do you see the definition of tribulation as? Persecution. He says tribulation or persecution that arises because of the word. So are these people going through tribulation because they're so bad? No, they're going through tribulation because they're standing on the word of God. And because they have taken a stand for the word of God, because they have received the word of God with all gladness, they're going to go through persecution or tribulation. If you look up every single verse that uses the word tribulation, it's used 22 times in the New Testament. None of those times says anything about there being a rapture before the tribulation or anything like that. So the pre-tribulation rapture people have to rely on a lot of interpretation. They got to explain it to you. It's always really complicated. Well, if you follow every single time through the New Testament that the word tribulation is used, 90% of the time it's talking about believers going through tribulation, saved people going through tribulation. And the other two times it's used where it's not talking about saved people, it has nothing to do with the end times prophecies. It's just talking about people going through tribulation in general. And this is what I've heard a lot of people say. Well, you're right. There is no clear verse that says that it's uh, before the tribulation. But there's no clear verse that says that it's after either. So we have to, you know, we got to study, we got to make charts, we got to go to Ruckman, we got to go to Tim LaHaye, we got to go to Kirk Cameron and give us a little more, you know, insight. We got to go to all these Bible teachers that are going to explain it and break it down to us. And, uh, and this, is the, this is the craziest one I've heard. Oh, you need to study Jewish wedding customs. <laughs> if you study Jewish wedding customs, you'll know it's pre-trib rapture. You're not going to see me at some Jewish bar mitzvah. You're not going to see me at a wedding. You're not going to see me eating a kosher meal on the airplane. You're not going to see me wearing a funny hat. I'm going to trim my beard to this level that you see right here. I'm not going to go to some Jewish wedding to learn about God from people who don't even believe in Jesus. Right. 
I heard about a church recently. They had a Jewish rabbi in the service, and somebody walked up to him afterward and asked him, do you believe in Jesus? He was speaking in the Baptist church. He said, do you believe in Jesus? He said, no. Wake up. The Jews don't believe in Jesus. Now, there could be people who are of Jewish ethnicity who believe in Jesus, but the religion, Judaism, it rejects Christ. And I'm going to get to that in a moment. But where did I have you turn? Matthew 24. Because people will say, well, we don't have a clear verse that says it's before the tribulation, but we don't have a clear verse that it says that it's after either, so we have to study to show ourselves approved. Yeah, study to show yourself approved, but you've got a really clear verse that says that it's after. It says in Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation. And sometimes I want to just ask people, what part of after do you not understand about this passage? But it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man. The Son of Man was something that Jesus called himself while he was on this earth. He said, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Jesus is coming in the clouds. A trumpet sounds. He sends the angels to gather his elect. Now, if you would, keep your finger there and just go to Mark 13. Now, Mark 13 pretty much says all the same things that Matthew 24 says. It's, it's what the, we would call a parallel passage. You find the same preaching, the same teaching in these two chapters. Uh, you could put them side by side. They say the same things. Uh, let me just show it to you in that passage. It says in verse 24, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the son of man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Now, at this point, we could just pray and go home. We should just be able to just close our Bible and say, there you have it, folks. It's after the tribulation. Just close our Bibles and go home. But oh no, we're not going to close our Bibles and go home. Amen. Because I'm going to prove to you and, and show you this is talking about the rapture. And this says it's after the tribulation. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Because before we get into Matthew 24, I want to show you the most famous rapture passage in the Bible. This is the one where the Bible goes into the most detail about the rapture. And this is the most famous passage about the rapture. And anyone would agree that this passage is talking about the rapture. This is the most clear teaching in the Bible about Jesus coming in the clouds and us being caught up together to meet him. And so let's start there. Let's start in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. The Bible reads in verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. So what he's saying here is that he doesn't want them to be ignorant about Christians, believers who died, those who are asleep in Jesus, those who've already gone on to be with the Lord. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this, brethren, because I don't want you to mourn like those who have no hope. I want you to know that you're going to see your loved one again that was a saved person. You're going to see them once again because the Bible says that when Jesus Christ comes back, He's going to bring them with him. The dead in Christ shall rise first and so forth. That's why he said in verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. That's why this is a really popular passage you'll hear at funerals. I've been to a lot of funerals where people comfort one another with these words about seeing their loved ones again. So it says, for if we believe, verse 14, that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or come before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another 
with these words. What's the comfort that we'll see our loved ones again? Now, a lot of people will take this and say, see right there, the comfort is that we're not going to go through the tribulation. Does this passage even mention the tribulation? No. Was anything about the tribulation mentioned? No. He said, hey, you're worried about your loved ones that are asleep in Jesus. Of course, you want to see him again. He says you will see them again because if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, in the same way, he's saying, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. They're going to be resurrected. The dead in Christ shall rise first. He says, comfort one another with these words. He didn't say comfort one another that you're never going to go through tribulation. Comfort one another that you're not going to be persecuted. Comfort one another that there's a pre-tribulation rapture. That's not what he's saying. And so that's taken just completely out of context. The comfort is comforting someone who's lost someone that they loved. That, hey, if you're a believer and they're a believer, you'll be reunited. Those who do, you say, what about those who aren't saved? Well, there is no hope. That's why he said he didn't want believers to mourn like those who have no hope. Because there are those who have no hope. It's the unsaved. It's the unbelievers. Now, notice some elements in this quintessential rapture passage. You've got Jesus coming in the clouds. You've got a trumpet sounding. And you've got those who are saved being caught up together with him in the clouds. Now, did Jesus come all the way down to the earth in this passage? He's in the clouds. Did Jesus personally come down to the earth and pick us up and take us out? No. We are brought up to him because the Bible says, this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? Yeah. To meet the Lord in the air. So he's not coming all the way down. He stays up in the air. He's up in the clouds. So we're caught up by whom? By someone else because we are caught up to meet him in the air. Okay. Now, keeping those elements in mind, go back to Matthew 24 and see the exact same elements in Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Matthew chapter 24 is, is basically the, the time, the first time where Jesus, as you're reading the New Testament, really goes into detail about end times prophecies and end times events. His disciples ask him, they say, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So this is where he begins to break down to them the end times events and he tells them, take heed that no man deceive you for many shall come in my name saying I am Christ and shall deceive many. You shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you be not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. He says in verse number nine, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So he's obviously talking to the believers, he's talking to his disciples, and he says, they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now, a lot of people will try to say that Matthew 24 is talking to the Jews, and they'll, they'll just write this passage off and say, oh, this is only for the Jews. A lot of people would say, well, the Jews have been hated of all nations throughout history. But wait a minute, were they hated of all nations because of the name of Jesus Christ? No. They don't even believe in Jesus Christ. And so he's saying, you're going to be hated of all nations for my name's sake. That proves he's not talking to Jews. That proves he's talking to believers. He's talking to the saved because they're the ones who are claiming the name of Jesus Christ. And he says that they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. So this is a chapter about believers being persecuted. He says, then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And that many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Matthew 24, verse 21. He says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. There have been some pretty serious tribulations in this world, have there not? Think of communist China. Think of Cambodia. 
Think of times throughout history when God's people have been persecuted and killed for the cause of Christ. And you might think, oh, it was horrible in the Spanish Inquisition. Or, oh, it was horrible when they were persecuted at this time or that time throughout history. But the Bible says that there is coming tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time nor nor ever shall be. The tribulation is not just a time of persecution. In Matthew 24, he talks about famines starvation. He talks about pestilence. He talks about natural disasters. We've seen a lot of those. He talks about warfare. Have there been some pretty bloody wars throughout history? There have been some serious bloodbaths, but unlike the tribulation, which will be worse, the famines will be worse, the pestilence will be worse, the wars will be worse, the persecution will be worse. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So he's talking about these days of tribulation. He's saying this is gonna be a time of persecution. It's gonna be a time of affliction. Believers are gonna be killed for the cause of Christ. And he says, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Because the tribulation is a time of persecution where believers are killed for the cause of Christ. And if it were allowed to run its full course, they'd all die, they'd all be dead because they'd all be put to death. But thank God those days will be shortened for the elect's sake. Well, who are the elect? Well, the Bible's clear. If you look up all the times that the Bible used the term elect over and over again, it's talking about believers. Over and over again in the epistles of Paul, when he's talking to the Gentile believers, he calls them the elect. He says uh, that the Thessalonians are elect. He talks about uh, those that are Gentiles scattered abroad, that they're elect. Now, the reason that's important is because it says in verse number 24, of Matthew 24, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So the Bible's saying that during this end time period, during the tribulation, there are gonna be false Christs and false prophets that are gonna be so slick and so convincing that if it were possible, they would even deceive the elect. But notice, if it were possible, that means it's not possible. Which means that the Bible's telling us in Matthew 24, 24 that the elect are not gonna be deceived. If the elect is referring to the Jews, that they're not gonna be deceived by these false Christs and false prophets, why is their religion a religion of false prophets and, and false Christ? Because if you think about it, the Bible says, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denied the Father and the Son. The Bible says that there are many deceivers that are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. So the religion of Judaism that's teaching that Jesus Christ is not the Messiah, teaching that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh, that is a false Christ. That is an Antichrist. That is a false prophet right there. If the Bible's saying in verse 24 that it's impossible for the elect to be deceived by a false prophet or a false Christ, if that were referring to the Jews, well then why are they all deceived by false prophets and false Christs who tell them that Jesus isn't the Messiah every week at their synagogue? So that right there shows that these people who are unable to be deceived by false Christs and false prophets, these are saved believers who have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. The Holy Spirit's gonna guide them into all truth. And when the Antichrist comes along, believers are gonna know that it's not Jesus Christ because they have the Holy Spirit living inside of them and the Bible's clear, they're not gonna be deceived. If this were referring to the Jews, it wouldn't make any sense because they're the most deceived people religiously because they definitely believe that Jesus is not the Christ. So this is the key, this is the key scripture right here. The first time that Jesus ever brings up the rapture. You know, as you're reading your New Testament, you crack open the New Testament, like I did when I was 12 years old. I read the book of Matthew cover to cover for the first time when I was 12 years old. The first time you're gonna get to Jesus Christ covering this subject is in Matthew 24, where in verse 29 he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. 
So when he's gathering the elect, who's he gathering? He's gathering the saved believers. He's not gathering Jews. He's gathering those that are saved because the saved are the elect, not the Jews. Because they're the ones who are not deceived. They're the ones who believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. They're the ones who are saved. They're the ones that are God's people. And so he's saying he's going to gather the elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And that's amazing to me that people will somehow teach that Matthew 24 is not talking about the same event as 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4 is the classic rapture passage that everyone knows is talking about the rapture. Everyone believes is talking about the rapture when Jesus comes in the clouds, the trumpet sounds, we're caught up together with him in the air. All of those elements are here in Matthew 24. It's the exact same thing. The trumpet is there, Jesus is coming in the clouds, the trumpet sounds, the elect or the saved, the chosen, are caught up together with them in the clouds. How can these be talking about two different events? It's the exact same thing. And so it's pretty clear what it says after the tribulation. Now, the pre-tribulation rapture pretty much hangs on this idea that Jesus Christ could come back at any moment. And it's what's called the imminent return of Christ. They believe that Jesus is coming back at any moment. And I've asked several people where they're getting this from or where the Bible says that Jesus it could come at any moment. And what they inevitably come back at me with is, well, the Bible says no man knoweth the day or the hour of his coming. But what I always ask them to do is to show me where it says that in the Bible. Because if you go to where it actually says that in the Bible, it's in this exact same chapter, Matthew 24, 36. And the Bible says in Matthew 24, 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. Know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So people will take that verse and say, see right there, no man knoweth the day or the hour. That means it can happen at any moment. But notice he said, but of that day, no man knoweth the day or the hour. So the question is, which day? Well, it's the day that he just finished talking about. And here's the thing, back in verse 29, he said that that day is after the tribulation. He said in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation, he describes the events that are gonna happen then he says, of that day and hour knoweth no man. So we don't know the day or the hour, but one thing we do know is that it's after the tribulation because he says it in the same passage. So basically pre-tribulation rapture believers will take this verse out of context. They'll take this verse, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my father only. And they'll say that proves that no one knows when the rapture is gonna take place, therefore it can happen at any moment. But then what's funny is you'll just go up a few verses and show them the part where it says after the tribulation in the exact same passage, and all of a sudden they'll say, oh, that's not about the rapture. You'll point to the verse that says after the tribulation, they say that's not about the rapture. But then a few verses down when it says no man knoweth the day or the hour of that day, all of a sudden, oh yeah, see, that's the rapture right there. And then when you go down a few more verses and it says, then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left, all of a sudden that's the rapture. And so, is Matthew 24 about the rapture or not? Because it's clearly about the rapture, because you've got the trumpet sounding, you got Jesus coming in the clouds, you got the elect gathered, uh, as it says in Mark 13, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven, and it's clearly the rapture of that day and hour knoweth no man. Do I know the day or the hour that the rapture is gonna take place? Absolutely not. But do I know it's after the tribulation? Well, that's what Jesus said. A lot of people will attack this chapter and say this, you can't get your doctrine on this from Matthew 24 because Matthew 24 is only talking to the Jews. And some scholar somewhere decided that the book of Matthew is to the Jews, the book of Mark is to the Romans, the book of Luke is to the Greeks, and the book of John is to the world. Well, thank you, God, for including us in at least one of the four Gospels. But who comes up with this stuff? Now, look. Maybe Matthew is geared toward the Jews. Maybe is Mark is maybe Mark is geared toward the Romans. Maybe Luke is geared toward the Greeks. Maybe the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians was geared toward the Ephesians. Do you think? Maybe the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews was geared toward the Hebrews. Maybe the epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians was geared toward the Thessalonians, but every promise in the book is mine, every chapter, every verse, every line. The book of Titus wasn't just for Titus. That was a short-lived book. It's for every pastor to read. It's for every believer to read. It's, it's the New Testament. It's for all of us. But wait a minute. You say Matthew's to the Jews. Okay, how about Mark? That's, they, they say that's for the Romans. Says the same thing immediately after the tribulation. But here's what they say. No, 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 Pastor Anderson, you don't get it. 
This whole sermon was preached about the Jews, to the Jews, for the Jews. God was, or Jesus Christ, they say, was preaching to the Jews in the Olivet Discourse. That's the fancy theological name they gave to this passage. Matthew 24, Mark 13, they call it the Olivet Discourse. Pastor Anderson, he was talking to the Jews. Don't you get it? When he said in Mark 13, 24, after the tribulation, after that tribulation, and then he talked about Jesus coming in the clouds in verse 26 and gathering the elect in verse 27 from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. He said, they say, that's just talking to the Jews only. Okay, look at the last verse of Mark 13. Mark 13, 37. And what I say unto you, I'm only saying to the Jews. Don't let any preacher try to tell you this is for all believers. It's only for the Jews. Is that what it says in Mark 13, 37? No, it says, and what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. And yet somebody will turn around and say, this is only talking to the Jews. Unbelievable, isn't it? It's almost as if Jesus knew that people would say that. Someday people are going to try to say that this chapter is only talking to certain people. So I'm just going to throw it on the end. And what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. Isn't that amazing? So go back to Matthew 24. Now that we know he's talking to everybody. And, you know, I could show you this out of Mark 13. I could show you it out of Mark. I like to show it out of Matthew 24. You say, why do you choose Mark Matthew 24 over Mark 13? You know, one big reason is because this is how I learned about this doctrine. When I was 12, I decided to start reading the New Testament cover to cover. This is the first time I came across this doctrine because I started Matthew 1. I started reading it. I got into chapter 4 and it sparked my interest because it's, it, a lot of people are fascinated by prophecy. They're fascinated by the end times. They're fascinated by the rapture, the tribulation. So as a young 12-year-old, obviously this got my attention as I'm reading and I get to this chapter that's talking about such an intense subject. And this caught my attention right away. And when I got to that part that said after the tribulation, I knew it was talking about the rapture when it talked about Jesus coming in the clouds. I knew it was talking about Jesus coming in the rapture when that trumpet sounds in Matthew 24 and he gathers the elect. And I walked away that day not believing in the pre-trib rapture. And I've never believed in it since. That was 18 years ago. Never believed in it since. Everything I've read since then just confirmed what I saw on that day. It wasn't hard to convert me. You say, who, who taught you this doctrine? You've been brainwashed. Who converted you? It was the Holy Spirit of God in my living room in Sacramento, California with a Bible in my hand, reading the New Testament cover to cover for the first time in my life at age 12 when I got to Matthew 24. That's when I was converted on this doctrine. That's why I'm going to preach out of this chapter tonight because this is the one that got me. But people will say it's only talking to the Jews. Well, I already showed you a verse that said it's talking to all, Mark 13, 37. But in case that's not enough, People will say, well, the elect, that's talking about the Jews, his chosen people. Because elect means to choose, right? Like if we elect a president, we're choosing a president. So the elect, they say, well, that's God's chosen people, the Jews. The elect is the Jews. Well, I've got a list here of every time the word elect used. We're not going to go through it because we don't have time. I could go through every time elect used, and I could show you that every single time it's talking about people that are saved. Uh, just to give you a quick highlight. In 1 Thessalonians 1.4, it says, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, talking to the Thessalonians who are clearly Gentiles, we saw it in Romans 8. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Out of 16 mentions of the term elect in the Bible, I found 10 re refer to all believers in general. Two of them refer to believers who are specifically Gentiles. So it can't be referring to Jews. One of them refers to believers who are Jews. Two of them refer to Jesus Christ himself. And one refers to Jacob the person as being God's elect, the, the character from the Old Testament, Jacob. I'll give you one verse that just clearly shows you that the elect does not mean Israel. Because people say the elect, that's Israel, that's the Jews. Okay, Romans eleven seven. 7, you don't have to turn there, but it says, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So the Bible says, Israel has not, the election has. Well, if Israel were the election, that wouldn't make any sense. Go to 1 John 2. Who's ever heard the term the Antichrist? Everybody's heard that term, right? You know, the Antichrist is a biblical term. 
You know, you'll often hear the Bible talk about the beast or the beast from the sea or the beast with seven heads and ten horns. And they'll talk about the man of sin, the, the son of perdition. You'll hear these terms used. But the Bible also uses the term antichrist. And I, I like to use the term antichrist. It's a term that people understand and it's a biblical term. I want to show you where the Bible mentions the term Antichrist because the Bible tells us there is a person coming someday that's called the Antichrist. I want to see quickly who that person is. It says in verse 18 of 1 John 2, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Now, is that singular or plural? So they've heard that Antichrist singular shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. So, there's one Antichrist coming, is there not? But aren't there many Antichrists even right now? That's what the verse says. Who are these Antichrists? Jump down, if you would, to verse 22. Who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who, that denieth the Father and the Son. Now, let me just explain this to you. This is key. In order to believe that Jesus is not the Christ, you have to believe that there is a Christ and that it's not Jesus. Does everybody understand that? These aren't just atheists who don't believe in God, don't believe in Christ, don't believe in... No, these are people who do not believe that Jesus is the Christ. It's not saying they don't believe that there is a Christ. It's saying they don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. There is a Christ and it's not Jesus. The word Christ means Messiah. The Bible says in John chapter 1, we found the Messiah, which is to say being interpreted the Christ. So the Bible defines the word Christ as Messiah. The two are interchangeable. So let me ask you this. Can you think of a religion out there that says there's a Messiah coming, but it's not Jesus. Jesus wasn't him. Judaism. The Jewish religion teaches there's a Messiah, all right, but it wasn't Jesus. They're still waiting for the Messiah. They say Jesus was not the Messiah. They're still waiting for the Messiah. It says... Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So he's saying, if you don't believe in the Son of God, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you don't believe in the Father either. A lot of people will say, oh, the Jews believe in the same God we do. They just don't believe in Jesus. Nope, different God. They don't believe in the Father. You can't believe in the Father without believing in the Son. Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. They have another God because they don't have the Father. You say, no, they have the same God. No, they don't have the same God. They don't have the Father. How can you say they have the same God when the Bible says that they have not the Father? Because they don't have the Son. If they don't have the Son, they don't have the Father, then they don't have the same God. And the Bible has a name for them, Antichrist. Amen. Now, you say, oh, you're a racist, you're anti-Semitic. This has nothing to do with race. Jude Judaism isn't a race, it's a religion. There are people who are of Jewish ethnicity that are believers, that believe in Jesus Christ. There are people that are not of Jewish ethnicity who believe in the religion of Judaism. The Bible talks about people becoming Jews. I mean, Jew is a religious term. It's not an ethnicity. It has nothing to do with race. All, all people are equal in God's sight as far as the Bible says that all nations of the earth are of one blood. Okay, there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. We're not talking about race here. We're talking about religion. The religion that teaches that there's another Messiah coming, the Bible calls an Antichrist. Why does the Bible call it Antichrist? Because there's a man coming called the Antichrist, singular, who's going to say that he's Jesus Christ. And when that Antichrist shows up in the tribulation and says, I'm Jesus Christ, they're going to accept him as their Messiah. A lot of people will teach, oh, when Jesus Christ comes in the clouds, the Jews will finally realize that he was their Messiah and they'll accept him. No, they'll accept the Antichrist. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says, when Jesus said, I've come in my Father's name and you receive me not, another will come in his own name, him you will receive. He says that if you believe that uh, Jesus Christ, oh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but he said here, if you don't believe Jesus is the Christ, he says you're Antichrist. If you believe in some other Christ, go if you would to the next mention of Antichrist. Go to uh, 1 John 4 3. 1 John 4 3 says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh 
is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Same consistent thing. You don't believe in Jesus Christ. You don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. Go to 2 John, one page to the right in your Bible. In verse 7, the Bible reads, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. It doesn't say that they don't believe someday the Messiah is coming. No, it says they don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he already came, that he already is come in the flesh. Past tense. They're not going to believe him on the second coming. Folks, they didn't believe him the first time. They're not going to believe him the second time. The first time they rejected him. The first time they nailed him to the cross. The second time they're already going to have fallen for the Antichrist hook, line, and sinker. They're going to have the mark of the beast in their forehead or in their right hand already. Because their whole religion is called the spirit of Antichrist. Their religion is Antichrist, according to the Bible. So, all that to say this. You say, why did you show us that, Pastor Anderson? Because I wanted to show you that in Matthew 24, it said that the elect would not be deceived by false Christ and false prophets. If that is talking about the nation of Israel, let me ask you something. Are they being deceived right now by false prophets and false Christ? 99% of them do not believe that Jesus is the Christ. 99% of them reject the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore, they are the most deceived people in this area. So would it make any sense to God, for God to say, oh yeah, it's not possible for the elect to be deceived if it were the Jews, when they're the most deceived? You say, you don't know what you're talking about. No, you don't know what you're talking about because I've been soul winning in Tempe in areas that are heavily Jewish, and I'm telling you something, I try to give them the gospel. I love them. I showed them what the Bible said. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to be saved. They rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you're going to tell me the elect is the Jews? No, it's the saved. They're the, the saved are the ones who won't be deceived. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's living inside of them. That's why they won't be deceived. Pre-tribulation rapture teachers pretend or act or say that they... they take the Bible literally, but as soon as they get to a passage that, you know, they want to make it sound something else, then they spiritualize it, they, they take it as an analogy. People who believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, they do these mental gymnastics <laughs> where they'll, you'll try to show them, see, it says right there, after the tribulation, this is what there's a, that's not about the rapture. That's not the rapture. You say, well, how do you know? Well, because it's after the tribulation. And of course we know that the rapture is before the tribulation. But they'll say, well, that can't, that's not the rapture. But then you'll ask them, well, where does the Bible say that the rapture can happen any moment? Well, right there it says, no man knoweth the day they are. You just said this wasn't about the rapture. So when it says it's after the tribulation, Matthew 24 is not about the rapture. But when it says that no man knoweth the day or the hour, now all of a sudden Matthew 24 is about the rapture again. And when it says, you know, two are in the field, one taken and the other left, well, that's about the rapture again. Just shut up and do what you're told. Just shut up and believe in the pre-trib rapture because I said so. You say, give both sides. Be fair, give both sides. Okay, here's the other side. Shut up and believe what I told you to say. Quit asking questions. Yep. Shut up and believe it because I said so. That's the pre-trib side. <laughs> I mean, it's true. They've got nothing. I've got scripture after scripture after scripture, and they got a whole lot of nothing. That's what they've got. You say, you got a bad spirit. You better know I do after 18 years of listening to this garbage. And, and keep in mind, folks, God's not out to confuse us. He's not trying to mess with us. Man has been messing with you. Amen. Preachers have been messing with you. TV shows and movies have been messing with you with Left Behind and all this stuff. God's not messing with you. You know what happens in 1 Thessalonians 4? The rapture. That's what we turn to. The, the, the quintessential rapture passage. So isn't it interesting that in the, in the chapter right before that, just by coincidence, he happens to say in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse number 4, For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. As soon as you finish up with the 1 Thessalonians 4 passage, which is the big famous rapture passage, you get into chapter 5. He picks up with a conjunction, but. So he's still on the same subject. 
chapter 5, verse 1, he says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Why does he have no need to write unto them about the times and seasons? For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So he talks about the rapture. He explains Jesus Christ coming in the clouds. And then he says of the times and the seasons, you don't need me to write and tell you because you already know that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So right there, he's calling his coming in the clouds. He's calling the rapture as it were. He's calling it the day of the Lord because he goes, he gets finished talking about Jesus coming in the clouds and he says, but of the times and the seasons, you have no need that I write unto you for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So he's referring to his coming in the clouds as the day of the Lord. They're both one and the same. They take place at the same time. He says, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now, a lot of people will take this and say, see, he's coming as a thief in the night. We don't know when he's coming. He could come at any moment. Like a thief in the night, he's going to come and we won't be expecting it. But that's only if you're not saved because the Bible says, but ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Now, a lot of people say, well, there are no signs to his coming. He can come at any moment. But if he could come at any moment, then what are we watching for? If he could come at any second, if he's going to come in a twinkle of an eye and we're not going to know and it's going to overtake us like a thief in the night, then what are we watching for? But he said, no, you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. It's going to take the, un the unbelieving world as a thief the children of darkness. But he says, you brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. And yet preachers over and over again will say, he's coming as a thief in the night, thief in the night, thief in the night. When Paul is flat out saying, if you're saved, it will not overtake you as a thief in the night because you already know it's going to happen. And that's why Jesus said, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draw of night. So he's saying, you're going to see things happen and then he said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up for your redemption draw at night. Watch. Watch for these things. Watch for wars and rumors of wars. Watch for famines. Watch for the pestilence. Watch for the abomination of desolation. He said, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, he said, when you see these things come to pass, when you see the sun and moon darkened, then look up for your redemption draw at night. Look up. Watch. When you study the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel, the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter number 11, in verse 31 it says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. So in Daniel chapter 11, it tells us that they place the abomination of desolation. In Mark 13, it refers to the abomination of desolation not as a person, but as an it. And then in Daniel uh, chapter 12, in verse number 11, it says, And from that time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety uh, days. So when you study the, this phrase, abomination of desolation, you find it referred to as it, not a person, but a thing. You find in Daniel that it says they shall place it, uh, and we're told that it's set up. So it's being talked about as if it's uh, not a person, but a thing. And I believe the abomination of desolation in the book of Revelation is found in chapter number 13. And if you look at verse number 14, it says in Revelation 13, 14, and deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did lift. So here you find the false prophet who's kind of, you know, playing the part of John the Baptist for the Antichrist and preparing the way for him and teaching about him. You find John the Baptist trying to get the world to worship the beast and it tells us that he sets up an image uh, that uh, of the beast and in verse 15 and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast sh should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed and then in verse 16 it tells us and he causes all both small and great rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead so you find that in Revelation 13 they set up an image 
people are forced to worship the image. If they don't worship the image, then they're put to death. If they worship the image, I, I believe that's when they receive uh, the mark of the beast. And that image is what I believe is being referred to as the thing that's going to be set up, the thing that's going to be placed. The it of Mark 13 is that image of the Antichrist. And we need to understand that things are going to get bad throughout the tribulation. But when we as believers see an image of a man, and that man is declared God at that point, and that man, and that image is something that they're going to want us to worship, we need to understand that is the great tribulation. That's the time that you just head for the hills. That's the time you don't even go back to get your coat. Uh, that, that's going to be a time of great persecution. Revelation is not really as hard to understand as most people make it out. And I think the key to understanding the book of Revelation is understanding how it breaks down. The first 11 chapters, they follow a chronology that makes perfect sense. You know, you start out around the time of Christ, as, as far as the same century as Christ, okay? Then you get into the events of the future, the tribulation, then the rapture, then God pouring out his wrath. And then when that seventh trumpet sounds in chapter 11, there's kind of a finality where he says, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. But what's interesting is when you get to the end of chapter 11 and you have that finality at the end, well, then you get into chapter 12 and there's a major gear change in the book of Revelation here. But he starts over in chapter 12 and he starts to replay the same events. Chapter 13, the tribulation. Chapter 14, the rapture. Chapters 15 and 16 deal with his wrath. And you see the same thing playing out again. So really, the best way that I could help you understand the book of Revelation is just to tell you, just cut it in half. Right at chapter 11, 1 through 11 on one half, 12 through 22 as the other half. And then if you put those halves side by side, you'll see the same events from two different angles. Now, when I, when I usually preach about the subject of the tribulation and the rapture, I usually focus on the first half of Revelation. And the reason I do that is because the first half... I think is a little bit clearer and a little bit easier to understand. The second half is a little bit more symbolic, but I've preached a lot more on the first half. So tonight I want to preach a little bit on the second half and show you some things in the second half because I think it'll help you understand the events that may take place very soon, maybe in our lifetime. We will see these events begin to come to pass. And so I want to just go through just a couple of chapters here, starting in chapter 12, and show you the order of events of the end times and, and what we're going to be seeing here very shortly. We may be alive. We may, it may be beyond our lifetime. This could happen 100 years from now. We might all be gone. But I think it's very likely that it will happen in the near future. In fact, I would be shocked if these things did not happen, at least in my lifetime, if I live out my normal lifespan. You know, I'm 31 years old. And, you know, I'd be shocked if this doesn't happen in the next 40 years. At the speed which things are going right now, I'd be surprised if this doesn't happen in the next 40 years. And when I start to get into the message tonight, I think you'll understand a little bit why I say that. Okay. But let's start out in chapter 12, because this is a starting over of the book of Revelation. Look at the first verse of chapter 12. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. You know, that's not really literal, is it? I mean, can a woman really put on the sun as clothing? Can she really have the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars? Obviously, this is a little bit symbolic here, okay? And so this woman gives birth unto a child, and we know from verse 5 that child is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, she brought forth a man-child, verse 5, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. That comes out to roughly three and a half years. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with them. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. 
Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So what do we see here? There's war in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. And the Bible teaches that the devil loses this battle. He loses this war in heaven. And because he loses the battle, he and his angels, which here it shows it's one third of the angels, they are cast down unto the earth. Basically, this is Satan being cast out of heaven. Now you say, wait a minute, Pastor Anderson, hasn't that already happened? And many people even teach that this happened, you know, even before the Garden of Eden. They teach that Satan was already cast out of heaven even before the events of the Garden of Eden took place. But that's not true at all, because if you remember, in the book of Job, the devil comes and stands before God and has a conversation with God in heaven about his servant Job. You remember that? And what does he do? He begins to accuse Job, remember? I mean, the devil's in heaven accusing us and talking bad about us before God. But thank God, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, he says, my, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And the reason that I know this hasn't happened yet, first of all, it definitely hadn't happened in Job's day because he was still doing it in Job's day. But you say, well, how do you know it still hasn't happened? Well, because the Bible's clear that when the devil is cast out of heaven, that he knows that he has just a, a short time. And he's very angry. He's cast out and he has great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Now, people might say, oh, this happened at the time of Christ. At the time of Christ, that's when Satan was cast down. Well, that's not a very short time because that was already almost 2,000 years ago. That's not a very short time, number one. But number two, the Bible gives us some numbers about what he means by that, a short time. He says here in verse 13, when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place. Obviously, again, very symbolic here. Where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of of the serpent. Now you say time and times and half a time, how long is that? Well, if you compare that a little bit earlier, remember we read in verse six, where it said that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Well, that adds up to three and a half years. So if you take a time times and a half a time, isn't that three and a half? Because the time would be one times would be two more. That makes three and a half a time. That's three and a half. And so this time period that is coming up is three and a half years or 1260 days. So we're not talking about thousands of years, are we? No, we're talking about finite short amounts of time here. And that's why it says he has great wrath because he knows that he had a short time. And go back to Genesis 3, because in the question on your mind, who is this woman? What, you know, who is this woman? Now remember, it's very symbolic. She was clothed with the sun. She had her moon, the moon under her feet, and she had a crown of 12 stars. Uh, she's a sign that's appearing in heaven. She's shown, you know, basically giving birth to Christ, and he, Christ, ascends up to the throne of God and so forth. But look at Genesis 3. This might help you to understand a little bit. The Bible says in verse 14, this is, of course, in the Garden of Eden, the Lord God said unto the serpent, notice, the serpent, because thou has done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity. What does enmity mean? Enmity. It comes from the same root word as our word enemy. Okay. He says, I'll put enmity between thee and who? Now, isn't that kind of what we see in Revelation 12? Basically, the serpent persecuting the woman, the, the serpent uh, seeking to destroy the woman. And it says here he would put enmity between thee, between who? The serpent and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It says here that he'll put enmity between the serpent's seed 
and the woman's seed. So does the devil have seed? Absolutely. Doesn't the Bible tell us about the children of the wicked one? The children of the devil. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 8? Year of your father, the devil. So are there people on this earth whose father is the devil? Remember the parable of the tares in Matthew chapter 13? When the, 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 the householder, he sowed good seed in the field. But while men slept, an enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. Tares are weeds. That field where the man sowed good wheat, that's the world. He said in verse 38, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. That's those who are saved, the children of God. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. So we do we see the seed of the serpent there, the children of the wicked one, the sons of the devil. He says, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. So in Genesis chapter three, we see that there is enmity between the woman and the serpent and between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed, right? Who are the serpent's seed according to the Bible? The children of the wicked one, right? The children of the devil, the children of Satan. You say, is that every unsaved person? No, no. It's not every unsaved person, but it is those who the Bible teaches have become reprobate. It is those who have completely uh, gotten on board with Satan. They have completely and finally rejected the Lord Jesus Christ because the Bible talks about how the Jews were of their father, the devil, and he told them that they would never be saved. He told them that they had no forgiveness in this world or in the world to come and that they had, uh, they, their hearts had been blinded, their hearts had been hardened, it was too late for them. And that's in John chapter 12, I don't have time to turn there. And I've done whole sermons where I go into, you know, the children of the devil and, and, the, and you know, here's another term that's used for this, the sons of Belial. Do you remember that term? Belial, think about the word Belial, Baal, Beelzebub. Do you see how these words are all from the same root? Satan is Baal or Belial or Beelzebub in the Bible. And I'm here to tell you that there are sons of Belial on this earth, just like all throughout the Old Testament, you know, these certain sons of Belial. And if you remember the Sodomites in Judges chapter 19, they were called sons of Belial, okay? And on and on throughout the Bible, we see the concept of these reprobates, these sons of Belial, these children of Satan, these children of the devil. They are the children of the wicked one. The reason that they are the tares amongst the wheat also is because the Bible talks about how they'll creep in many times as a Judas Iscariot who was called the son of perdition, similar terminology. So look down, are you still there in Genesis uh, 3? It says, I'll put enmity, verse 15, between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head. Now what's the it there? That's the seed of the woman. It, because he's talking about the two seeds, it shall bruise thy head. And who's he talking to? The serpent. He's saying that basically the seed of the woman will bruise the head of Satan. And then it says, and thou, talking to the serpent, shall bruise his heel. So he's saying that the seed of the woman will bruise Satan's head and that Satan would bruise the heel. But notice it says shall bruise his heel. So here the seed of the woman is singular, his. His is a singular word, isn't it? And it says in verse 16, unto the woman he said, I'll greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception and on and on. It talks about her bringing forth children. So with that in mind, go back to Revelation 12. Who is the seed of Satan? That's the children of the devil, the sons of Belial, the children of the wicked one. Who is the seed of the woman? Well, if we remember, the woman brought forth a man child in chapter five. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman. He's the son of man. He was born of a woman, was he not? And again, this woman is symbolic, not a literal woman wearing the sun as clothing. Okay, this woman is symbolic. This woman brought forth Jesus Christ. Okay, and this is all tied in with what we saw in Genesis 3. Go to verse 17. And remember, the devil has come down to the earth. He's been cast out of heaven. He has great wrath. That means great anger because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Look at verse 17. And the dragon was wroth. Wroth is related to the word wrath. It means angry. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war 
with the remnant of her seed. Now, who is this remnant of the seed of the woman? Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, these, this remnant of the seed of the woman. And who are we talking about when we're talking the seed of the woman? I mean, basically, we're talking about human beings, obviously, that are born of women. He says that these are the remnant of the woman's seed, not all the woman's seed, the remnant of the woman's seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, many people will try to say, the woman here is, is the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. Now, here's the problem with that. Were the Jewish people in the Garden of Eden? Had the man Israel even been born? He wasn't going to be born for thousands of years. This, ha this is a struggle that predates the nation of Israel and the Jewish people, does it not? This is a struggle between the serpent and the woman that goes back to the Garden of Eden. And so this struggle is far greater than just the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, and so forth. No, it's about the people who believe in Christ and keep God's commandments. Here's where that war begins, right? Because in verse 17, he's going out to make war. How's he going to do it? How is the devil going to make war with the believers? Look at uh, chapter 13, verse 1. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So this beast that's described, the Bible says the dragon is the one who gave him his power and gave him his seat and gave him his authority. Look at verse 3. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now, does forty and two months kind of ring a bell with time and times at half a time? and 1260 days. See how these things all kind of tie in? He says in verse six, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Watch this, verse seven, here's the key. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Now, didn't we see in chapter 12, verse 17, the dragon's goal was to make war with those who believe in Christ and keep the commandments of God. Here he says, it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Watch this, to overcome them. You say, well, that's depressing. Well, just read to the end of the book and you'll see what happens. You know, you'll see who wins in the end, okay? This is just a temporary setback in chapter 13, okay? But he says in verse 7, it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So this man that's called the beast, this man who has power over all nations, all kindreds, all tongues, his goal is to make war with the saints. And the Bible says that everyone on the earth will worship him. Wait a minute. No, it doesn't. It says everyone on the earth will worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. So is there somebody who's not worshiping him? Oh, yeah. Guess who it is? The saints. The saints are not worshiping him. The saints are who he's making war with. This man, because he is called a man, he is called the man of sin. He is called uh, by these personal pronouns in this chapter, he, him, his, okay? This man will have power over all tongues and kindreds and nations. So let me just tie it all together for you quickly and we'll move forward. Satan is cast out of heaven. He knows he has a short time. He goes to make war against the believers and the saints. And what does he do? He does it by putting a man in power, doesn't he? The dragon gave him his power. He puts a man in power over the entire world, over every kindred and every tongue. And this man will carry out the devil's war against the saints. You say, how can that be? 
because just because the United States maybe agrees to put this guy in power, is, is Iran going to agree with it? Is China going to agree with that? Is Russia going to agree with that? Well, wait a minute. In order for this man to take power, there's going to have to be a government that's a global government, that's a world government, right? In order to give all the power to one man, there's going to be a global government, a world government. So you say, Pastor Anderson, what's the first thing that's going to happen? What is the, the, the point at which these things begin to come to pass? Well, it's the devil being cast out of heaven. But wait a minute. We're not going to know that. We're not in heaven to see the war in heaven. We're not going to know when that takes place. But that's the first thing. What we're going to see is the events in Revelation 13 starting to unfold. And of course, Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, when we see the abomination of desolation, that's when we know it's real. That's when we know for sure beyond a shadow of a doubt. You know, we're going to see this world government basically forming. And, and we're going to see uh, this man that's going to have this power over all the world and over all the earth. Now, again, I'm focusing on the latter half of Revelation. You know, we could at this point turn to Matthew 24, and we could turn to Revelation 6. Those two places would give us a little more detail about this phase known as the tribulation. And it, if we turn to them, which we're not going to for sake of time, we'd see wars, we'd see famine, we'd see pestilence or disease, and we would see great inflation. The Bible teaches there will be hyperinflation because the Bible tells us that a measure of wheat will be sold for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and the Bible teaches that a penny in those days was a day's wages. You worked all day for a penny, if you remember in the book of Matthew. And so buying, buying a bag of, of, of wheat, and it took, you know, 200 bucks or whatever, you know, a whole day's wages, 100 bucks, you know, it took that much just to buy that bag of, of wheat, a measure of wheat. Obviously, that's an extremely high. I mean, would you want to go to the store and buy a bag of wheat and, and shell out a 12-hour day's wages? But we see here in chapter 13, this man come to power and he's making war with the saints. You say, how's he going to make war with the saints? Okay. Well, the Bible says in verse 11, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So here, this, this man is demanding worship. Okay, it says in verse 13, he doeth great wonders, wonders or miracles, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Look at verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would now worship the image of the beast should be killed. So I don't really know exactly what kind of an image this is gonna be, but it's some kind of an image of the beast that can speak and, and cause that as many as will not worship or kill. And, and so I don't wanna speculate about this image, but you know, it's gonna be something that, that can talk and that can uh, cause people to be killed. Look at verse 16, here's the key. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six, or 666. Now, the mark of the beast is a tool that he's using to make war with the saints because of the fact that if you can't buy or sell, it's pretty hard to function in today's world, isn't it? Or in any world. So not only does he make a law that says, if you don't worship the Antichrist, you're gonna be killed. That's a persecution right there. That's making war with the saints. But not only that, he also makes it impossible for the saints to buy or sell. And so those that are saved, those are the saints, they're not going to worship the beast. The Bible's clear on that in Matthew 24 and elsewhere. So they're not gonna be able to buy or sell and they're gonna have a death warrant on them. Now imagine yourself right now in a world, and I didn't say in a nation, I didn't say in a country, I said in a world where you can't buy or sell and where there's a warrant out for you to be put to death.
Can you imagine how difficult it would be to survive in a world like that? Not only that, what about all the surveillance cameras that are going in? What about the license plate reading cameras? What about the naked body scanners? What about the showing your ID at checkpoints? What about showing your ID to get on a bus? Showing your ID to get on a train? Showing your ID to get on an airplane? Showing your ID at checkpoints as you're driving in your car? And you know what? Pretty soon you're gonna have to show something else. Okay, let's see your right hand. Okay, you're good to go, have a nice day. This is not far-fetched at all. This is not something that is, that is uh, unrealistic at all. I mean, maybe when people read this a few hundred years ago, they didn't look at it the same way as we look at it. When we look at it, it has a little bit of flesh on it, doesn't it? Because we are already seeing That's why I think that this may be close. I don't know. But you better listen tonight. You say, oh, I don't like this stuff. This isn't something I like to hear preaching on. Well, you know what? You need to hear preaching on this. Because you know what? You're going to thank God one day for every sermon you heard on this. If this begins to happen in our lifetime, you're going to say, oh, man, I, you know, I don't know why Pastor Aaron's always preaching on Bible prophecy. You know what? You're going to thank God for every sermon that you heard like this. You're going to be racking your brain. What was Revelation 12 about? What was chapter 13 about? What was chapter 14 about? Trying to understand and come to grips with what's going on around you. And this information I'm preaching to you tonight, straight from the Word of God, is going to be gold someday. Amen. You say, how is it possible to cause people not to be able to buy or sell? Well, the Bible says he'll make it so that you can't buy or sell. It's really simple to explain how that is. See, everybody uses this, don't they? Well, one day, I'm telling you the truth, one day this piece of paper will not be worth anything. One day this piece of paper will have no value. I can promise you that. Because they will say, this will not work anymore. You must use this. And it's going to be a mark in your right hand or in your forehead. You say, why the right hand or the forehead? Because not everybody has a right hand, do they? But everybody has a head. <laughs> okay, you know, I've seen, I've seen some pretty handicapped people. But, you know, everybody has a head. Okay. But here's the thing, this isn't just gonna be a barcode. This is gonna be a barcode or an implantable microchip or whatever that you get by worshiping the Antichrist. That's why you and I aren't gonna get it because we're not gonna worship the Antichrist. We're not gonna be deceived by the Antichrist. And the Bible's clear on that. Look if you would at chapter 14. So that's chapter 13, isn't it? We see the cashless society. We see a one world government. And look, that's why no Christian should support the United Nations. It's of the devil, it's of Satan. It's his world government that's going to install the Antichrist, okay? But look down if you, and by the way, the United Nations is based in the United States. I don't know if you know that. But everything about the United States is, everything our government has is always good, always, God bless the USA. I'm proud to be an American. You know, and, and, and don't let me confuse you with the fact, but the United Nations is based in New York City. Don't let me confuse you with the facts, but the United States funds and created the United Nations, okay? Don't let me confuse you with the facts, Mr. Patriotic, apple pie eating one that thinks that, you know, the government of the United States can do no wrong, and anybody who criticizes the government's not patriotic. Well, I will criticize a government that's fulfilling Satan's plan with their checkpoints and all their ID and UPC and all this, this horrible tracking that's going on today. I will criticize it. And you know what? I do love America. I love the America of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. I love the America of Samuel Adams and George Washington. You know, I love the concept of America. I thank God I was born in America. But does that mean I love what our government is doing today though? No. In chapter 14, he says in verse 1, I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads and on and on. I'm not going to go through this whole chapter for sake of time outside the scope of the sermon, but he talks about the 144,000 and I'll explain why that's significant in a few moments. But jump down if you would to, to verse 9 for sake of time. The Bible says, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, because that's what we just covered, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Notice it doesn't say or, it says and. Worship him and receive 
his mark and his forehead are in his hand. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now, first of all, no saved person will take the mark of the beast. We know that from Matthew 24. There are a lot of other scriptures. I'm not going to go into that for sake of time. I did a whole sermon on that called The Mark of the Beast, where I covered that in great detail. So no believers are taking the mark. But here's the thing. When an unsaved person takes the mark of the beast, they become reprobate at that moment. Do you get that? When they receive the mark of the beast, they have just sealed their faith. Now, I do not believe that every single person who is unsaved will take the mark of the beast. I don't believe that. I, and again, I, I could go into a lot of evidence for that, and I've done it in other sermons. I know people who live off the grid, you know what I mean? And they're not even saved, and, and they're not going to be taking the mark of the beast. And there are a lot of people who are people who just, they're just aware of a lot of the abuses of government, libertarian type people that aren't saved. They're not Christians, but they're not taking the mark of the beast either. Okay. And not everybody is going to worship the Antichrist, okay? But those who do, those who do take the mark, and those who do worship the Antichrist, they will be damned. The Bible's clear. They have sealed their fate. It's done. Just as when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're sealed unto the day of redemption. You can never lose your salvation. Well, these people who are sealed with the mark of the beast, they can never lose their damnation. I mean, they're done. So that's clear from these verses. Look, if you would, at verse 13. So right after a discussion of the, of the beast and the mark of the beast, he says in verse 13, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, meaning from here on out. Yea, set the spirit that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now, that you, what you just read there is very significant event. This is the rapture. Now, it's crystal clear, isn't it? So we have Jesus come in the cloud, and then we have an angel crying out with a loud voice. That's the shout. That's the voice of the archangel. He says, thrust in thy sickle. And who is he talking to? Him that sat on the cloud. Thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Let's quickly go back. Don't, don't turn there, but let's go back to the parable of the tares for a moment. Remember the wheat? What, would the, what did the wheat represent? The children of God, the children of the kingdom. And what did the tares or the weeds represent? The children of the wicked one, right? So what did the parable of the tares say? He said, gather ye together first the tares. Listen now. Gather ye together, first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. And what we see in the tribulation and in this period where the Antichrist is ruling, the tares are being identified. Okay, the tares are being singled out. The tares are being gathered together also because we see all nations of the world gathering together, all religions of the world gathering together. They're all being united. They're all being bound together in their allegiance unto the Antichrist, and they're all being identified for later destruction. He gathers together first the tares and binds them in bottles to burn them. He gathers the wheat into his barn. And who were the reapers? The Bible says the reapers are the angels. The harvest is the end of the world. The good seed or the wheat are the children of the kingdom. The tares are the children of the wicked one. What we see in chapter 14 here are, are 
two reapings. So let me ask you this. If Jesus is in the cloud and there's the voice of the archangel and he comes in the cloud and it's time for the harvest and he reaps the earth, who's he reaping? The saved, the good seed, the children of the kingdom, the saved. So he reaps the believers to go where? Into his barn, to go to his house. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, he said, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4. But look what happens next. It says, after the earth is reaped, after Jesus comes, look, look, just get it through. The son of man is Jesus. He comes in the cloud. He reaps the earth. He's reaping in the wheat. But look what happens next. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. So this isn't the son of man. This is an angel coming with a sickle. First, Jesus came with a sickle. Now this other angel's coming with a sickle. And it says in verse 18, thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. That's a serious bloodbath. Think about how high a horse bridle is. Imagine a river of blood that a horse could cross and the blood will reach up to the horse bridle. That is a lot of blood. And you know what? That blood is coming from human beings, according to this. There are going to be mass casualties when God pours out his wrath on this earth. These are the sequence of events that we just read about. And I broke it down to you. But in chapters 12 through 16, here's what we read about. Satan's cast out of heaven. He's mad. He goes to make war with the seed, the righteous seed, the saved children of God amongst men that are keeping his commandments also. Okay, so we see him angry. He wants to attack the saints. How does he do that? He creates global government. He creates a world government. He puts his man at the top, the Antichrist. Then he makes a law that says you must worship the, the image of the beast and the beast himself. And you can't buy or sell unless you take a mark in your right hand or in your forehead. Then we see the Lord Jesus Christ come in the clouds and remove the saved, reap the harvest of the earth, right? Then we see another angel who has power over fire commanding and ordaining that the children of the wicked one be cast into the winepress of the wrath of God. Then we see those plagues unfold in chapter 15 and 16, the seven plagues of God's wrath. So isn't that interesting, the timeline? We've got the tribulation, which is what the Bible calls earlier in the book. He calls it the tribulation in chapter 7. He calls it the tribulation in Matthew 24. The period where there's persecution, where the Antichrist is there with the mark of the beast. We have the tribulation in chapter 13. Describe, do we not? Chapter 13, the tribulation. Chapter 14, we saw the rapture. Chapters 15 and 16, God's wrath. It's always in that order. Matthew 24, tribulation, then Jesus comes in the clouds. Mark 13, tribulation, then Christ comes in the clouds to gather. Revelation 6, tribulation. Revelation 7, rapture. Revelation 8 and 9, wrath of God. Go to the latter half of Revelation. You know, you got tribulation, you got rapture, you got wrath of God. It's not that complicated. It's not that hard to understand. And I hope that tonight's sermon shed a little light on the second half of Revelation for you. It gave you a little bit more information. You know, study to show thyself approved unto God. Don't always, you know, you can't always just rely on the pastor. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But I'll tell you this, the information that you heard tonight, remember it, because it may come into play later on in your life. There may come a time when you thank God that you heard this sermon, when you see these things begin to come to pass.